All right, guys, welcome back to another video. My name is Cody Groom. Okay, this is going to be a little bit of a long, long winded video, and let me explain. We're in the United 2 today, and I was thinking about this car, and I was thinking about how long I've had it. I've had it about three years now, going on four. And there's a lot of things I wish I would have known before I bought it, but also a lot of things that I think I would have done differently or just, you know, kind of thinking about the car as a whole. Anyway, so. If you're thinking about buying an E92 M3, this is the video for you. Like I said, it's going to be a little bit long-winded, so bear with me. You do have full control to obviously skip through this. So if there's something you don't want to hear more about, skip it. So let's jump into it. Now, I wrote a bunch of stuff down. It took me a while to kind of go through everything, get all my thoughts out here. So I'm going to be looking at my phone here and there to actually give you guys... I don't know. It's hard to remember all this stuff. So first up, let's talk about this car as a whole. Like If you're purchasing this car, what's your motivation? Why do you want it? And I know another, other people are going to say, like, well, it's got 400 horsepower, it's a V8. Like, obviously, I, I, yeah, there's a lot of great things about this car. And one of the things that I feel like doesn't get dis discussed enough is, is this car dailyable? Like, if you're buying this car and it's your only car, which I think a lot of people are, this car is dailyable. I think there's a lot of good factors about it. I don't know if that's a word, but we're using it today. Obviously, gas mileage sucks. We're not. That's not why you purchase a car like this. That's not even on there. But that being said, I average, I think, about 15 miles a gallon driving it back and forth, and I don't really drive it easy. So about 15 miles uh, per gallon. Um, it's in stock form. The suspension is really comfortable. Like The seats are really comfortable. You can definitely drive this back and forth from work, from wherever. Um, you have room for back seat. I mean, back seats for passengers. There's a decent amount of trunk space. I mean, it's a good sized car. It's definitely not a small car. And so that being said, you got a lot of room. You got a lot of room for all the, all the stuff you need. Um, when it comes to the ergonomics of the car, I feel like it's a pretty good setup. There isn't a lot of storage space for other than the trunk. Like you have this little center console that I know you guys can't see right now, but there's not a lot of storage. Like that's it. There is a little cool part of the door where the actual flaps open. So in other words, the bottom part of this door, I don't think you guys can see it. You guys can't see that, but this will open and it's kind of cool. It's a little neat feature, but again, there's just not a lot of storage in here. Um, then we get to stuff like actual drive. So th this is the dual clutch. Now, obviously you could have a manual, but that being said, it doesn't, it's not super smooth. I can see why later cars have gone to automatics and different things because for the general person that doesn't really care about performance, the dual clutch is kind of uh, clunky. Like the best way I can describe it is it doesn't always work the exact way I've, ex I've expected it to work. Like in other words, it's not an automatic and it is, but let me explain. When I say it's not an automatic, I mean that it doesn't have a torque converter and you feel that. Like I can feel the clutches engaged. I can feel when I'm getting on the gas and I'm on the throttle, but I'm not moving yet. And I'm, I'm playing that like manual game where I kind of letting the clutch out, but I have no control of the clutch. And that's irritating sometimes when you're in reverse, sometimes when you're in stop and go traffic. It's hard to predict exactly what the dual clutch is going to do. And that can be annoying sometimes. That being said, on the other end of it, it's an amazing driving transmission. Like, I absolutely adore it when I'm in the canyons. I love being able to go switch the gears, even just, you know, running it automatic, having the shift settings. You can adjust between the harshest and the lightest. Uh, settings and that to me is huge like it's an amazing thing but something to be you know thought about if you're taking it on a daily basis it does have that little quirk but overall i think it's a pretty comfortable and dailyable car now when we jump to reliability mine has been pretty reliable i have mine at seventy eight thousand miles and really haven't had to do much i actually have not done my rod bearings yet so i'm kind of playing i'm gambling a little bit i think when it comes to rod bearings now, rod bearings are something to me, obviously, it's a big deal. It's a catastrophic failure, and you want to get it fixed. I think a lot of it has to do with how people drive their cars. Now, one thing I do constantly, and this may not do anything, but based on people I've talked to that know more than I do about this, is that it has a lot to do with not letting the car fully warm up. And so I basically, I baby the car. I don't even rev it past 3K went before it's warm. Once it's warm, it's a different story, but I always try to make sure that it's warm before I'm revving, before I'm getting hitting those high RPMs. And I feel like that's a big part of it. For people that are driving this back and forth to work, that may not be possible. They may be getting on the freeway. They may be impatient. They're like, okay, I got to get going with traffic, all this. 
And that may not be something that's kind of going through their mind. They're just driving from home to work and back. And sometimes people that even have a shorter distance, it's not fully warming up all the time. And it's constantly at that state where, you know, it's not the right temperature. Like it's everything's not lubricated the right way. I can see that really being an issue. Now, that being said, obviously you want to budget whenever you're purchasing this car or purchasing the 92 M3 for the rod bearings. Just get it out of the way. Do it. I'm kind of just speaking here as that'd be a good idea. Like I said, I haven't done it. You have... So you have five common problems with the E92. There's more, but these are like the main ones that I thought of. You have the idle control valve, you have which basically give you a rough idle, some different things. I think it's about a thousand dollar repair somewhere on there. A uh, valve cover gasket. I have that issue. My valve cover gasket is currently leaking, and it's not a huge issue, but there's oil leaking, right? And anytime you have an oil leak, that means you know you're gonna eventually leak out a certain amount. It's good to fix it. Different different problems can happen, but it's never been a huge issue of mine, and it's something that is fairly costly to repair. You know, to, to take off the valve covers, do all that. It's not extremely difficult, but it is something that's time consuming and something that, you know, it shouldn't be leaking oil. A car shouldn't be, but it's a BMW, so we deal with it, I guess, right? Um, obviously, the rod bearings and then the throttle actuators. Now, I've heard mixed things on throttle actuators, but from my understanding, the throttle actuators go bad and they are a lot of times replaced with OEM BMW parts. And that means they will go bad again. It's more of a lifespan and less of like you can do preventative. Now, obviously, if something has 20,000 miles on it and you're replaced with something brand new, that in a sense is preventative maintenance. But there's no harm in the throttle actuators going out. You just have them go out, you go and fix it, and you move on with your day. So, but that's still something that ends up in your pocket, ends up costing you. Um, so it was actually four, not five. I had five. I told you guys five, but it's four. Now, I do think about other things when you think about this car. It is, It does have 19-inch wheels, stock, right? And that is huge because that means your tires are going to be more expensive. Not something you typically think about, but I believe the stock sizes of this car are 235, 35, 19, and 255. Oh, no, sorry, 245, 35, 19, and 255, 35, 19 is the stock sizes. I'm not sure. I haven't ran stock sizes in a long time, but that at 19 inch wheel does get expensive. And this being a 400 horsepower, 400 horsepower rear wheel drive car, you do want some sticky tires in there. You want something that can support the horsepower. Tires get expensive. Also, you can picture that you're going to run through them a little faster because you can't rotate them. You have a staggered setup. You could run a square setup, but that requires you to buy different wheels. So a staggered setup meaning the front wheels are smaller than the rears. Like right now, I'm running nine and a half in the front and ten and a half in the rear. So I think if you're planning on purchasing a car like this, you need to have at least like three to five grand ready for anything that's there. Not even stuff to go wrong, just general wear and tear. Um, you can't expect this to have the same maintenance requirements as a Honda, as something that's just more meant to run. This is something that's definitely, you know, you're running tight clearances. It revs out to 8250. It's a 400 horsepower car. You know, there's a lot of refinement here, but that being said, with refinement does mean ma more maintenance and just more keep up to make sure that everything runs accordingly. Like I said, oil leaks. I don't really have a lot of oil leaks. I do have that valve cover gasket, but that is something to think about. Like, you're going to have little stuff like that. It is a BMW at the end of the day. And BMWs are known for leaking oil. Um, when it comes to this car, this is a 2011. Um, this is probably the last year that I would recommend buying. Or sorry, the the oldest year that I would recommend buying. And the reason is, I do not have Bluetooth in my car. Not a huge deal, but the entertainment's a little older. So I don't have Bluetooth. I have to run it through wherever this is. I have an aux cable that's set up right here. And... It's kind of annoying. Like, it's kind of annoying to have this car. And, you know, it's a little old for technology not to have just simple Bluetooth. You can do a com box upgrade, which is the box in the rear. And that'll upgrade you to the Bluetooth. But it's $500 for that that you could save by purchasing something past, I believe it's 2011.5. And that'll give you Bluetooth. Um, there are some aftermarket alternatives. But when you start going aftermarket, you start to lose compatibility and different things. Like, for example, you can get the unit right here, have a CarPlay unit. But the problem now is I've heard a lot of different things about sound, about the sound not being as good. And that's something you can kind of expect when you start to modify BMWs. There's a lot of computers and a lot of electronics working together. So when you start modifying stuff, you can expect the sensors and different things to not understand exactly what's going on. 
I mean, even to the extent of I'm running Olin's Road and Track on this car, and I have an EDC delete. And it's something to kind of think about. Like, now my car is going to ding every once in a while and tell me that EDC is not functioning right until I code it out. So I guess where I'm going with that is it it's starting to feel a little dated. And if you can get the later years a little bit better, if you can't, just understand those little things that you're going to have here. Again, there's solutions, and I know most most people buying this car do not buy it for the infotainment, but it is something to think about. Like, well, I know playing music is a very, like, fundamental thing when you're driving your car, right? I love hearing this exhaust. Every once in a while, I want to hear a song. I want to play some music. Um, I got, you know, I got my wife in the car, and we want to listen to something, and I love the stereo. Um, I do have the, I think it's Bob Sound uh, sub upgrades. My subs did go out. That is something that did happen. BMW quoted me at $1,800 and told me they were in the rear, and that is 100% incorrect. They are underneath the seats, and they are a five-minute fix. So I spent $500, fixed my subs, because at one point it sounded like my stereo was a phone stereo. It had no bass, nothing. Super easy fix. Um, took literally 15 minutes, plug and play. So make sure you understand your car before you take it to the dealership. Another thing when it comes to maintenance. So I think what really gets me excited, I'm talking about all this stuff and I'm giving you kind of the, the lowdown of everything good and bad. But the one thing that I think can't be looked past in this car is the experience this car gives you. This is a car to me that is just, you know, it's been called the poor man's 911. And I can understand that to an extent because this car really has a lot going for it. V8, A250 Redline, an amazing sound to the engine. It's a joy to drive paired with a dual clutch transmission or a manual. Can't go wrong either way. And... It looks good. It's a beautiful car. The interior feels engaging as far as like it's simple. It's not too much going on that even in this point, it doesn't feel too dated. There's little things that notify you of that, but it still provides that experience that I'm wanting from a car like this. And that's important because I think, you know, if you're like me, that's one of the reasons you're buying this car. Now, kind of getting into mods, right? Mods are a gray area for some people because some people are like, Leave the car stock. I don't want to touch it. I want to enjoy how it is. And that's fine. But a lot of you guys want to modify your cars. So I'll start with exhaust. Now, when it comes to the exhaust, I really think that there is not a lot that has to be done to this car to get it to sound good. It's already a high revving V8. There's not that much you have to do, right? So that being said, I'm running test pipes, which delete the cats. And then I'm running an axle back and performance exhaust currently. Um, I've also ran an axle back that I have a custom made one from Magnaflow that I really do enjoy as well. That's a little bit louder one. It's a little lower. This one's a little higher pitched, a little more exotic sounding. It just depends on what you want. So there are some bad sounding exhausts, but I would say for the most part, if you go with a reputable exhaust, they sound, they all sound pretty damn good. This car by itself sounds good. So you don't have to do a lot when it comes to that. Now, here's the bad part about things. Because this is a naturally aspirated V8, you don't get a lot from bolt-ons and tunes. You can probably expect after doing pulleys, test pipes, and a tune, you can probably expect about 400 wheel, and that's not a lot, right? That's not a lot for today's era of cars. It's still a good amount of power. It's still plenty of fun, but you know, especially people in the 335s, I know you guys are watching, you guys are like, oh, well, with a 335, I can make more power. At the N54, you know, okay, and that's fine, but... This is not a car you buy for power. This is not a car you buy for speed. This is a car you buy as an experience and you buy to understand how BMW made this car. Everything they put into this, the, the, you know, down to just the basics of the interior, to the way it looks, the engine, the, the sound that comes out of this thing, and the drive, the driving experience. Like I know I keep mentioning experience, but that's a large part of what comes into this car. That doesn't make up for the fact that it's slow in terms of torque, right? It doesn't, it doesn't have a lot of torque. It, you have to rev it out, but it still feels very quick to me, and it's a fun car to drive. I think another part of the mods is there's a huge aftermarket support for these. Um, being that it still is a 3 Series, a lot of things are compatible with a 328i, 335i, and jumping into the M3. So there is a huge aftermarket support from everything from steering wheels to paddle shifters to gauge clusters, trim pieces, front lips. Like, you name it, there is stuff out there. And it, there's a lot of relatively affordable stuff, and there's a lot of more expensive stuff. And I think there's not a lot of cars that I can say that have a similar aftermarket experience as BMWs. BMWs are very well known for having a ton of aftermarket support. And that's awesome. It wasn't always like that, but it's cool to see it now and see just all these assortments of parts coming out. So that is one cool thing. If you are someone that loves to modify your car, there's mods everywhere. There's 
a ton of stuff you can do and i think it's really i think jumping into kind of wear and tear when i think about the car like there are a lot of materials in here that i wish weren't in here and i say that like they had kind of these uh plastic plastic uh um, i don't even know what to call it it's almost like a plastic wrap or something that was over the steering wheel trim piece it's on like some of the window knobs and it's something that i can tell kind of just wear out our time i don't know if it's a protectant over like the stock the stock plastic because it's not clear it's definitely black um but it wears out and it just it's something that's kind of a hassle to peel off it's something i have to completely scrub off or like kind of pick off wish they didn't have it on there i'm also noticing little things like the buttons over time this is this i know guys i know this is kind of like a I don't know how how much you guys care about this, but the buttons, like little things like my AC, my AC knobs, like the buttons are kind of scratched off and you can expect that it's, t this car's, you know, 10 years old at this point and uh, almost 11 by the fact that it's a November of 2010 uh, manufacture date. And so you can expect a lot of things like that. Now, do a lot of those things matter? I feel like my interior still looks pretty good. I have 78,000 miles, so it has been driven. It's not something that's just been sat in the garage. But I feel like the interior still looks pretty good. I'm noticing the leather has some general wear and tear. Um, you know, stuff like the bolstering when you're getting in and out of car. That's, you know, typical for a car like this. And so I can't really say that there's a lot that has gone wrong. You know, stuff like floor mats. I need to get new floor mats. But I think where you can really start to think about cars like this is when you are getting up there in mileage, you have to remember that the car's been driven. And with something like this, there are a lot of... Of things that can get really expensive so when you're looking at mileage yeah you can have a car that was maintained really well and have good things but also stuff like the guibo and you know in the drivetrain everything the bushings you can have suspension that's had all the wear on wear and tear on it so i think stuff like that is where you start to dive into typical things that you should be watching out for when you're buying a used car right if this has a hundred thousand miles and someone has been driving this thing through canyons and ripping through it you're gonna have some wear and tear you know that's just the product of driving it so i think really looking at the united 2 looking at it as an overall picture right if you're going to buy one of these you're like okay so where how was it driven you know how many miles what was replaced typical stuff and then start to dive into the common problems you know where rod bearings done um throttle wax radiators when have those been done um i think motor mounts are also a common issue i didn't mention earlier but i think kind of using your best judgment around those common problems I think about buying another one of these that's the kind of things that go through my head um i think it's not a car that i would recommend buying as your only car but like i said it is daily drivable i just wouldn't recommend taking something like this and daily driving it even if you can kind of unless you're daily driving it like a small amount of miles you can allow it to warm up all those things that's fine just understand that this not that's not what this car was meant for this car is essentially the track edition of a three series and that's something to be thought out. It's not as daily drivable as something like the F80. And, um, you know, I think to a lot of people, you could you could argue with me and say, well, yeah, like my, my daily driver is a manual transmission this that's slammed on the ground. And I have no problems with it. And that's fine. I'm saying for, for someone that is looking for one of these, I think try to have a daily driver, put this away and enjoy it if you can. If you can't, then enjoy the hell out of daily driving this. Just understand it comes with its little quirky clunks and and things that aren't necessarily meant to be this smooth Honda Civic that you can drive. So overall, I guess my verdict here is this car, after having it for three years, the maintenance isn't too crazy. Just need money set aside for things because they can start to add up just from wear and tear and little things. The comfort of the car, you could, it's definitely a comfortable driving car. Uh, it's got spacious inside and the you have the trunk, you got room in there. Nothing to complain about when it comes to that. The looks still look great in 2021 to me. They, it still looks modern. It has little things that, that tell how old it is. But it, the design still holds true to the test of time. Like, it still looks good. So, really, guys, I think the E92 M3 is a great buy right now. If you can find one for 30 27 I still feel like it's worth it. I paid 33 for mine three years ago. And it's still rotating around the same price, which is cool. They are going up in value, but they're also becoming harder to find one that isn't, you know, high in mileage and hasn't been just torn apart anyways guys i know that was a bit long-winded and kind of rambled on a little bit but i hope that helped you guys if you're looking to buy an a92 m3 and uh if you enjoyed it hit that like button if you got something to say leave me a comment below and i'll catch you guys in the next one later